Germany, actually Dresden, the Max Planck Institute for the Physik Komplexer Systeme. It's the institute founded by Peter Fulde. And uh, <clears throat> technically, he did his PhD in, uh, in England, but practically, he actually did it in Okinawa in Japan, in under uh, Shannon. And then uh, he continued there as a postdoc. And then he went on on his Japanese trajectory. He worked at the Riken Institute in Tokyo. And then since 2019, he's a staff member at the Institute for Physics of Complex System in Dresden. Uh, he will be talking about the uh, ground states of uh, frustrated magnets. And uh, he's actually has methods on, to telling us what those ground states are, which is not a trivial thing. So thanks for being with us. And then let me hand this over to you. Okay, good. Thank you all for being here this morning. Um, and thank you very much to Andrea for inviting me. It's really, really nice to be here. Um, right, so as, so as Andrea said, um, I'm, a, I'm Owen Benson, I'm, I'm from Dresden, and I, my, main, my main research at the moment is in the area of frustrated quantum magnetism. And what I want to tell you about this morning is some research in that direction, uh, specifically studying uh, spin half uh, Heisenberg model on this lattice, the pyroclaw lattice, which is a network of corner sharing tetrahedra. This is a pretty well studied model. People have been interested in it you know, for a few decades now, um, but we actually managed to, to add something quite new to the discussion. And uh, in our studies of the ground state, we found not just one candidate ground state, but an exponentially large number of them with essentially indistinguishable energies. Um, and so we think, this is a, we think this is a pretty interesting result. I'll explain why as the talk goes on, uh, but this is really to give you the headline. We start with this, this uh, frustrated quantum model um, and we find that not that it forms these kind of com these kind of valence bond crystal states based on hexagons, um, but nevertheless, despite the, the the quantum nature of the model, nevertheless retains a large uh, degeneracy uh, exponential in the system size. And I'll justify that claim as we as we go on. Um, so this work I'm about to to discuss obviously wasn't done just by myself. It was done in collaboration, in particular, in collaboration with two very smart graduate students at MPIPKS. Uh, specifically uh, Robin Schaefer, who's recently defended his thesis and will soon be taking up a postdoc position in Boston, and also Benedict Placker, who's another student with us at, at PKS, and also working with uh, Roderick Mersner, who some of you may know uh, is, uh, is a director there. Okay, so, so just to give some, uh, some overview to start with, or not overview, but, but introduction to start with, I told you I'm studying the Heisenberg model on the pyroclaw lattice, so why am I studying this model? Why do I care about this one specifically? of all the models I could have written down. Well, to start with why Heisenberg model, right? So I think this will be pretty familiar to, to many of you. Uh, you know, a Heisenberg model is really like the most basic model we have for the magnetism of, of strongly correlated insulators. Um, so the typical motivation is we say, okay, we start from some, some Hubbard model, which is just saying, you know, we have some electrons, they're allowed to move around the lattice to their neighbors in a way that preserves their spin. Um, but at the same time, they uh, have some repulsion so that they don't want to be on the same site as one another. And if we take the limit of strong repulsion then, and half filling, then there's going to be one of these electrons on each site. But that by itself doesn't determine their spin. And to determine their spin, we have to do some perturbation theory. Uh, and the perturbation theory tells us that the effective model is this model, this with, uh, with, where the, the effective interaction is proportional to a dot product of the spin operators on neighboring sites. Uh, and has, in this simple example, uh, has positive sign. It's antiferromagnetic. So spins want to be anti-correlated with their neighbors. Um, and this is kind of like the basic model for magnetic insulators where, where correlations are strong and where spin orbit coupling is weak, by which I just mean that this is an, an isotropic model in spin space. So there's no notion of, 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 sp of spin orbit coupling or coupling to the lattice. Um, so this is, this is a very well studied concept. And then why do I want to put this model on the pyrochlor lattice? Uh, the reason is that the pyrochlor lattice is kind of a, the classic example of frustration in three dimensions. So if I put the Heisenberg model on a, on say a simple cubic lattice, then I might guess that, okay, the interaction is proportional to S dot S, uh, so, and with positive sign, so I can just put like one spin up and then put its neighbors down. And because of the nature of the lattice, I can, I can consistently do that across the entire lattice. And even though that's not strictly an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, it's kind of um, a good starting ansatz for the ground state and the real ground state is just that plus some, some small fluctuations. And in three dimensions, 
There's no Mermin Wagner theorem. There's no real bar barrier to breaking symmetries. So the ground state is just a symmetry broken state. So it kind of looks like this. Um, but when its interactions are frustrated, the picture can be really very different. So this is now, uh, if I put those same spins on a tetrahedron, right? Then, uh, and the particle lattice is made of tetrahedra. Um, then if I put you know, one spin one way and the next spin the other way, then the two spins down here don't know what to do. Um, and that has some consequences. It means for one thing, there isn't any obvious candidate ordered ground state. Um, and it means that there are at a classical level or a mean field level of description, there are many equally good options or equally bad options, depending on your point of view. And one might guess or hope that somehow quantum fluctuations mix all these different classical states to produce some exotic state, uh, which, which doesn't really have a classical analog, which is kind of intrinsically quantum in nature. And so this is what I mean uh, by saying maybe more exotic states uh, emerge. And so what do I mean by more exotic? Well, I could mean many things. I could just mean, I could just mean a more complex form of magnetic order, or I could mean some more unusual type of symmetry breaking, like maybe you break spin rotation, but not time reversal and have a spin nematic, or maybe you break lattice symmetries, but not time reversal or spin rotation, and you have a valence bond crystal. These are both, these are both kind of ideas that, that, that somehow, that sometimes come forward in, in frustrating magnetism, and indeed this valence bond crystal option is going to prove very relevant to our discussion today. Um, but the thing that's really animated a lot of the, the, the efforts in the field over the last 30 years is looking for this final option, the quantum spin liquid, where there's, there's either no symmetry breaking in the most ordinary formulation of quantum spin liquid, there's no, there's no spin symmetry breaking at all, or there may be some symmetry breaking, but it's kind of incidental to the nature of the state. And these quantum spin liquids are therefore characterized as these kind of highly entangled states without any real uh, kind of classical mean field description. Um, and with having uh, excitations which, with quantum numbers, which are fractions of the, the expected ones. So instead of having spin one spin waves, they have spin half spin ons. And there's been a huge effort um, directed in both theory and experiment over the last few decades into finding examples of this, both in, in terms of model examples and in terms of real uh, physical examples. And the, the, the intuition is that frustration somehow helps this happen because it suppresses classical order. And indeed, there's a further motivation to studying the particle Heisenberg antiferromagnet, which is that there are materials out there which at least somewhat closely resemble the, uh, the if, we, if we try and characterize their interactions, they're dominated by, by these nearest neighbor interactions with the magnetic ions forming a pyrothor lattice. And so here's a, there's a spin one example based on uh, nickel uh, ions and, and the spin half example, not so well characterized uh, based on molybdenum. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, these are the, these materials are out there, and if we can understand, and if we want to understand the physics of these materials, we need to understand the physics of this very uh, highly frustrated quantum model. And so that's really, uh, you know, these are the motivations for what I'm doing in this talk. Um, but before we get into the real, the real new stuff, um, I want to talk, kind of warm up by talking about a simpler, a slightly simpler model, a model where it's slightly easier to get to the physics, but which nevertheless demonstrates a lot of the reasons why people are so or have been very interested in, in pyrochores. Okay, and that model is the, is the same, same lattice, but now instead of Heisenberg interactions, we can have Ising interactions just between the Z components of the spins. And this model is actually a kind of effective model for the so-called spin ice materials, the, the rare earth, these rare earth oxide materials, um, where if you want to apply this model to these materials, all you have to do is, is imagine that the Z axis uh, is, is the axis on any given site, which points either into or out of the tetrahedron. Um, and then what you can realize with this Hamiltonian is that, uh, you know, the, the ground state of this Hamiltonian is any state where the sum of SCs around a tetrahedron is zero, which in the language of the, uh, of the original materials uh, means that you have two spins pointing in and two spins pointing out. And that's very under constraining from the perspective of the total degrees of freedom. There are exponentially many states on the lattice uh, with an exponent proportional to volume uh, that obey that constraint. And so you have very highly degenerate classical ground state. And this, this, class, this degenerate uh, manifold of ground states has some interesting properties. Um, firstly, uh, if you think about the two into out rule, it's sort of like a lattice version of Gauss's law, because if you imagine that each spin carries a little bit of some notional flux, then every bit of flux that goes into a tetrahedron has to come out. And so this, this flux has divergence B equals zero. And you can actually kind of describe the physics of spin ice at long wavelengths in terms of the, the fluctuations of this divergence as flux. 
and the free energy is, is kind of approximately Gaussian in those fluctuations. And by combining two, those two uh, equations, you can kind of work out a lot of things about this spin-ice model, uh, including that, you know, essentially this is describing the theory of classical magnetostatics, divergence equals zero and kind of NMG proportional to P squared. Moreover, the excitations of this are, are kind of uh, monopoles. They're, they're places where divergence B is not zero. And in terms of the microscopic degrees of freedom, that means that having three in and one out or the other way around. Um, and these, these monopoles are actually deconfined. They, they have a, they have a uh, interaction that goes as one over R and you can separate them to, to infinity with finite energy cost and they move independently of one another. So these particles kind of really uh, behave like monopoles. It's kind of like a classical analog of, of fractionalization because if I flip one spin, I create two essentially independent objects, each carrying half of the spin. Um, moreover, uh, this thing, even if I ignore the excitations, the, gr the ground states have very non-trivial correlations. So if we look at neutron scattering, which is kind of measuring the, the Fourier transform of the spin correlations, you see these, these bow tie shaped pinch point structures. And these are directly related to this div B equals zero condition, uh, because what this pinch point means is that you have kind of very weak scattering in one direction, and then, uh, sorry, very strong scattering in the other direction, which is related to the fact that divergence B equals zero means that transverse fluctuations are suppressed. Sorry, longitudinal fluctuations are suppressed. The longitudinal fluctuations are suppressed by this condition because Q dot B equals zero in momentum space, but transverse fluctuations are strong. And that's why you get these pinch point singularities uh, in momentum space. And so that's all at a classical level of description. And then, and then people got interested in saying, okay, well, what happens if we do something to these materials to, to, to enhance quantum fluctuations? And there's kind of a very like rough argument you can make that says, okay, um, if I have div B equals zero in the ground state, I can do what we do in, in kind of ordinary electromagnetism and satisfy that by introducing some field A and say that B equals curl A. And then if I add some quantum term in the Hamiltonian, it means that the, uh, the states labeled by this A aren't eigenstates of the Hamiltonian anymore, so it evolves in time and therefore there's some electric field as well. And if I make the kind of simplest action that I can that's consistent with all the symmetries and includes both fluctuations of the electric and magnetic fields, it looks like the action of, of uh, classical electromagnetism. Uh, not classical electromagnetism, sorry, QED, quantum electrodynamics. And so the intuition was, if I take one of these spin ice materials, I add some quantum perturbation to the Hamiltonian, maybe I get some new state where the ground state physics is described essentially by the vacuum of quantum electrodynamics. And this was the idea that was pursued uh, about 20 years ago now. Uh, by uh, Hamela and collaborators, and they they you know augmented this Ising Hamiltonian with a with a transverse transverse interaction, uh, and then applied degenerate perturbation theory in the set of degenerate two into out states, and then you get this ring exchange Hamiltonian, where if uh, you kind of have loops of spins which point head to tail around a loop, you can flip the entire loop, and that's consistent with the ice rules and generates quantum dynamics in this ice manifold. Now, this model is nice because um, it doesn't have a sign problem for quantum Monte Carlo. So the original model, if I have uh, anti-ferromagnetic interactions, has a sign problem. You can't do quantum Monte Carlo with it, or not very easily anyway. Um, but but this, this uh, effective perturbative model does not have that sign problem because you can, you can flip the sign of G for free using a unitary transformation. And so people then did quantum Monte Carlo on that model. And uh, the result is that indeed the, the kind of very rough argument that said maybe you get a U1 spin liquid that looks like quantum electrodynamics turned out to be correct. Um, here's what, here on this slide, there's one of the evidences for that. So on, the, on this, uh, this side of the screen, we've got the quantum Monte Carlo measurement of the spin correlations. And on the right hand side of the screen, we've got a lattice gauge theory calculation based on assuming the U1 spin liquid ground state. Um, and the two agree very well, which is one of the evidences that this, this model really realizes a U1 quantum spin liquid phase with gapped kind of charge-like excitations, uh, emergent charges, and, and gapless photons. All right, so that's, that's, the, that's the kind of Ising plus small quantum fluctuation limit of the model. There's this interesting quantum spin liquid phase, which has now been uh, quite vigorously searched for an experiment, and, and there are some candidate materials, uh, but that's, that's a story for another day. What I now want to do, having kind of motivated the, the problem, you say, okay, what if we now return to the much harder problem where we make the transverse interactions just as big as the, the Ising interactions? And this is the Heisenberg model then on the, on the pyrochloral lattice. So 
we can kind of run up to the problem once again by considering something slightly easier where we where we consider the classical limit. So in the classical limit, um, you can say, all right, the if I replace these spins by not I say that they're not operators anymore, I make them O3 classical vectors, and then I just look for the minimum minimum of the classical energy. And then in that case, um, you can see that kind of similar physics emerges to spin ice. So uh, you can kind of rearrange the Hamiltonian in such a way as to make manifest that any state which has zero total spin on each tetrahedron is the ground state. Um, and this, 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 is, this is here then is the ground state constraint that applies on every tetrahedron. And because this is a vector equation with three components, this is really like three constraints. And each individual uh, component of that equation kind of looks like the original ice rule from spin ice. So it's kind of like three copies of the same thing as before. Um, and indeed, because there's, there's many fewer constraints on this, this Heisenberg model than there are degrees of freedom, um, there's a lot of freedom to fluctuate in the ground state, and you retain this kind of classical disordered phase, classical spin liquid phase, uh, down to t equals zero. And once again, you see these, um, these, you see these bow tie-like features in the spin correlations, which are going to uh, signal that you have a, an effective uh, divergence-free field describing the ground states. Um, another consequence, if we in this classical limit, is that you have many zero modes in the ground state. So, for example. If I take any loop of spins, and if around the loop, the spins are anti-aligned, one to the next, then I can freely rotate all of them continuously without changing the energy of the system. And so this is a kind of zero mode of the ground state. Um, and the smallest such zero mode is around hexagonal loops. You could also define ones on bigger loops, but the smallest ones are on hexagonal loops. And these, these hexagonal zero modes um, have been claimed to actually be observed in experiments. So there's this material. Um, zinc chromate, which was studied 20 years ago, with neutron scattering. And interestingly, they didn't see the structure factor that you expect for, say, the classical Heisenberg model. This is a, a spin 3 of quantum magnet, so somehow a somewhat large spin. Um, instead, they see these, these structures which kind of fit very precisely to uh, a theory of independent hexagons. So it's like you populate each zero mode on the hexagons independently somehow. And that's the claim from this paper. And so these, these hexagonal zero modes are somehow uh, irrelevant, at least for some, some certain materials. So now the question is, how much of this survives if we forget about the, well, not forget about, but, but go away from the classical description and return now to low spin, let's say spin half. I'll say something about spin one as well at the end of the talk, but, but let's say spin half for now. What, what survives? Does anything survive, right? Or is it just a completely different uh, kettle of fish? And this is an old problem. People have thought about the spin half Heisenberg uh, model on the particle lattice since at least the early 90s. Um, and there have been many suggestions along the way, right? Which I'm going I'm to kind of introduce uh, the, kind of the, the story a little bit over the next few slides. So the earliest proposals were basically built around um, perturbation theory, uh, where you uh, divide the lattice into two sets of tetrahedra. And you keep the interactions on one set of tetrahedra, and then on the other set of tetrahedra, you just treat them perturbatively, and then you see what comes out of that. And those kind of those kind of methods um, came up with a, a ground state, which is essentially a type of valence bond solid, where you break the lattice symmetries, but but you keep the other symmetries. You keep spin rotation, you keep time reversal. And the nature of the symmetry breaking they proposed is that you uh, you have these two species of tetrahedra, as I said, uh, the red and the blue ones. Um, and the, the, the proposal is that there's some spontaneous symmetry breaking between these two types of tetrahedra, such that, say, on the, on the red ones, uh, the system goes into a spin singlet ground state. Um, and then on top of that, because there are actually many ways or multiple ways of making a spin singlet ground state on a tetrahedron, there's then some additional uh, translational symmetry breaking between the red tetrahedra as well. Um, and so you end up with this kind of complicated valence bond pattern. Um, now, one of, the, one of the obvious critiques of this, this result was that, well, uh, because of the way they did the perturbation theory, the inversion symmetry breaking was kind of put in by hand. So it's very unclear whether it actually is, is there because it's really there or there because you put it in when you, when you constructed the perturbation theory. Right, and so this, this, was, this kind of remained an open question. And, and later on, kind of more, say 10 years ago, uh, up to a few years ago, there were multiple different suggestions that oh, actually maybe the, the ground state on this lattice is really a spin liquid, really some, some kind of non-symmetry breaking state with these kind of exotic fractional excitations. 
um, and and basically uh, basically disordered in different ways. Okay, there are many. There are several different proposals. Um, and this 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 possibility is very difficult to decide between these different possibilities because there's no real controlled uh, numerical or analytical way of describing them. Um, and on top of that, there was also the possibility that maybe there's continuity from the Ising limit. So I I told you a few minutes ago that in the Ising limit of this this model, if I just say take the Ising interactions to be strong and the transverse interactions to be weak, I, we know basically pretty well what the ground state is. It's a U1 quantum spin liquid. So then one could imagine um, if you maybe if you start from the limit where we know and you turn up J perpendicular, you can ask the question, you know, is there a phase transition in between or is there continuity? And there were some mean field calculations which suggested that there could be continuity. They looked at kind of the critical value for, for an instability of U1 spin liquid as you turn up this J perpendicular. And they came up with a very large answer. Like you really need a really big transverse exchange, much bigger than one, uh, to, to destabilize the U1 spin liquid. And so that maybe suggested, okay, maybe there's maybe there's a continuity of the ground state. Um, more recently, uh, I and, and some of my collaborators argued something different that actually this this very large value of, of the critical transverse exchange is, is not uh, possible. And that there's some variational argument that says that if you if this U1 spin liquid is stable up to J perpendicular equals JZ, there must be a phase transition at that point. And then we kind of propose that maybe this Heisenberg uh, limit is, is kind of like a, a critical point or a, or a phase boundary between different types of quantum spin liquid. So this was another this was another proposal that was out there. But very little, very hard to choose between the different proposals. There were arguments for different versions, but no, nothing really definitive. Um, and then a few years ago, there was some kind of improvements in, in numerics that allowed a bit more uh, progress. So on the one hand, um, some of my collaborators um, in this paper managed to, to kind of apply DMRG, which is a numerical method usually applied in one and two dimensions, very difficult to apply in three dimensions, but they managed to um, find a way to apply it uh, to kind of moderately sized three-dimensional pyrochloroacetic clusters, um, and their result from doing this was that was that actually was actually kind of to return, at least in spirit, to the original old proposals from the 90s that you have these valence bond solids, which break the rotation and inversion and translation symmetries of the lattice. And, the, and this result from the DMRG also seemed to to at least agree qualitatively. With similar with something similar done at the same time uh, using a, a neural network variational approach, so a kind of very many parameter variational wave function, but on a, on a neural network, also kind of suggested uh, that there's this kind of uh, lattice symmetry breaking in the ground state. And so, in that sense, there's kind of been a, a pendulum of the consensus where you know it started off with these studies saying, okay, it's a valence bond solid, and then and then other suggestions saying, well, actually, maybe that, that's just an artifact of the method. Maybe it's a quantum spin liquid and then swinging back with the more recent numerics to saying, OK, actually, it looks like there is some symmetry breaking. But it's still, but even the recent numerics, the DMIG, it's very new to apply it in three dimensions. The cluster sizes are relatively small. The neural network, it's not very clear. It's not very easy to interpret what the data is really saying. So it's not like the question is settled. And so we wanted to kind of see what, what we could add. And in particular, what we were able to add is, an, is, a, is a different approach, a different numerical approach to trying to figure out the ground state based on a method called NLCE, which stands for Numerical Linked Cluster Expansion. And so in the next few slides, I will try and explain what Numerical Linked Cluster Expansion is. Um, so basically, NLCE is a way of generating a series expansion using a succession of exact diagonalization calculations on increasingly large clusters. Um, and the way the, arg the, the argument for how it works goes like this. I suppose I want to measure like some quantity of some property of the model, some, some extensive quantity like the energy. Right? I can write that quantity on the full lattice, on the complete system, as a sum over the subclusters, over the subsystems within the system, and some weights in those subsystems where I define these weights, these, these kind of subcluster weights as being the expectation value of that property measured only on that cluster minus recursively defining the weights of the smaller subclusters which sit within that cluster. Now that's, that sounds very complicated, but essentially this, this equation, the important thing to realize about this, these two equations is actually they're completely trivial. All I'm doing is adding up a bunch of stuff and then subtracting again, and the final result is just the expectation value I was looking for originally. So 
these, this equation is true, but it's true in like a, a kind of trivially useless way, which doesn't help because computing the sum is just as hard as solving the whole problem. Um, but the useful insight is that if I order the sum by, by kind of si increasing cluster size, then as long as the, the correlations in the ground state or the correlations in, at the temperature where I'm trying to measure are sufficiently short ranged, then the weights above the size corresponding to the correlation length become really, really small and the, the sum can actually converge quite quickly. And so what you can do is then truncate the sum at some, some maximum cluster size, which is probably set by what you're numerically able to calculate. And you can check whether, whether the, the sum has started to converge, whether successive orders agree up to that cluster size. And if the correlations are sufficiently short ranged, then this will work. And the, I guess the good thing about this method is um, it's essentially exact when it converges and you can tell if it's not converging, right? Um, so this is, this is really the strength. Often, so, so for many cases you'd be interested in, it just won't converge, but then you'll know it hasn't converged and then uh, you can do something else. Um, so, okay, one way, one way to justify this, this, this approach is to justify it from high temperature expansion, where you can notice that the weight functions Basically, if you diagrammatically expand them in a high temperature expansion, every individual weight function only contains terms where the perturbation acts on the entire subcluster. And so if the correlations are short range, then you, that kind of gives you a justification for why uh, large clusters won't be important. But although you can motivate it from a perturbation theory, it's not actually a perturbative method because all of the cluster weights are calculated from full exact diagonalization. There's no actual small parameter. So, and that gives it the possibility to converge outside the regime where you would normally expect it to, depending on the circumstances. The other important thing to realize about numerical link cluster expansion is that there are lots of ways of constructing it because there are lots of ways of constructing the series of subclusters. And I'll show you in a minute an example of that. And actually this really matters. Um, so depending on how you construct the series, the series might either converge or not, and you somehow have to pick a series of subclusters which reflects the physics of the system you're interested in. So, so one way to do it would be just have the subclusters be individual sites. So your zeroth order is one site, and your next order is two sites, three sites, four sites, five sites. Keep going. But you don't have to do it like that. And indeed, the natural way the people way people have done it in the past for the particle lattice is to do it by tetrahedra. So the zeroth order is always one site, but then first order, I include a cluster which is a tetrahedron, next order, two tetrahedra, three tetrahedra, et cetera. And then on the right-hand side, you see uh, a calculation of the specific heat as a function of temperature for the Heisenberg model on the particle lattice using this tetrahedral expansion. And the different colored lines are different orders of the expansion, and basically when they will agree, that's when the expansion's converging. Um, and then you can do some tricks, which are these red lines to make me converge a bit better, and then you get down to a temperature of like, I don't know, maybe 0.2 or 0.3 J, and the calculation is converging, right? But you don't get down to zero temperature. You get down to a temperature a bit less than J, and you can measure things like the specific heat. And it's not really surprising, right, that it fails at low temperature. It's built on assuming short range correlations. So why should it, why should it keep going to zero temperature? And indeed for the tetrahedron expansion, it doesn't keep going to zero temperature. The big surprise is that if you do the expansion slightly differently, instead of doing it in terms of tetrahedra, do it in terms of hexagons. So you can also build up a pyrochlor lattice by uh, having one, by connecting a series of hexagons. And if you keep on connecting them, you can build up a pyrochlor lattice like this. And if you do the expansion instead of tetrahedra in terms of hexagons, then something weird happens. This is the energy in the hexagon expansion. That's the, the orange curves and the tetrahedron expansion is the blue curves. The energy is a function of temperature. You can see that everything agrees Different orders agree, different methods of doing the expansion agree at high temperature. That's what we expect, correlations are short range. As we go down, we see that successive orders of the hexagon expansion start to disagree with each other and even start to show unphysical results where the energy isn't even a monotonic function of the temperature. So at that point you might think, okay, this is broken, right? So we can't do this anymore. But then if you then do the calculation at even lower temperatures for the hexagon expansion, the two lines come back together. The, the convergence is kind of re-established at low temperatures. And that's very different to the tetrahedron expansion. In the tetrahedron expansion, this blue line, you know, one order goes up to infinity, the other order goes down to minus infinity, that, that's it. So below t equals like 0.2, it's done. There's nothing the tetrahedron expansion can tell you. 
But somehow for the hexagon expansion, it seems like it reestablishes convergence when you get close to the ground state. It's very weird. So then you can ask like, okay, what, what does it mean? So what we think it means is that the ground state is efficiently, is efficiently represented by weakly correlated hexagons. That's the kind of intuition you get from, from the fact that this expansion seems to work at low temperature. And then we can try and make that idea more precise. Okay, so we've, we've motivated it from the, the surprising results we got from the linked cluster expansion. So then let's try and go away from the linked cluster expansion and, and try and motivate it with a variational wave function. So how do we do that? So the first thing we do is we partition the lattice into non-overlapping hexagons. There's more than one way of doing this, which is a point I will return to in a minute. But okay, for now, let's just say we find some way of partitioning the lattice into non-overlapping hexagons. And then we rewrite the, ha the Hamiltonian in such a way that you know, this first term, H0, is just the Hamiltonian internal to the tetrahedron, so non-interacting hexagon, so not internal to the hexagon, so non-interacting hexagon Hamiltonian plus V, the interactions between the hexagons. And then we say that psi naught is the singlet ground state, which is the ground state of the non-interacting model, where you just have a spin singlet on each, on each hexagon, some kind of hexamerized ground state on each hexagon. And then we generate a variational wave function by applying an exponential operator, which dresses that ground state with fluctuations, and then alpha is a variational parameter. And then we can write down the variational energy. In general, this is extremely hard to evaluate. Um, but what you can do is hope that the optimal alpha parameter is sufficiently small that you can expand this energy in powers of alpha and then uh, check whether the, you find a minimum within the region where the expansion is still converging or where, where you still have small errors due to the truncation. And this is what we did. So this curve here is the exponent, is the variational energy as a function of alpha, x axis is alpha. And we see that where the expansion is still, successive orders are still agreeing with each other, we have a well-defined minimum. Um, and the, the value of this minimum agrees with this black line, which is the energy that was previously obtained from DMRG. So that suggests that indeed we can, in a controlled way, find what this variational energy is. And to within the numerical precision of our estimate, it agrees with the DMRG energy. And indeed, this is a this is then a, a comparison of different variational energies showing that, okay, we agree with DMRG and our variational energy is lower than, for example, the previous valence bond solid suggested or lower than previous numerics. Now, as I said, there's not just one way of doing this because there are many ways to put hexagons on a pyrochloral lattice. And this is just, at this point, this is just like a classical statistical mechanics problem. How, way, how many ways can you cover this lattice with hard hexagons? And, uh, what you realize, what we realize essentially from doing numerics is that um, the, the, the only ways to do this are basically to make these layered stackings, like the, the, like the uh, figure shown here, where you have the kind of a layer here, and then you go along a one zero zero direction, you have a next layer, and the next layer, and next layer. Um, and there are three different possible stacking directions, so that gives you a factor of three in the degeneracy to start with. But then more interestingly, um, there's also a degree of freedom, which is that in any given of these layers, I can shift the system by half a unit cell and get to a different state without affecting the states, the layers above and below. Which means that I gain an exponential factor proportional to two to the L uh, in, the, in the ground state degeneracy. And I find not just one possible hard hexagon covering, but, a, but a, a huge number of them, an exponentially large number of them. And as best as we can determine, all of these ways of, of layering hexagons down give you essentially the same, the same variational energy. So um, that's essentially the main result. And we can wonder like, why, why do we get this result? Um, like we can kind of try and post justify, why would a, a state like this be stable? So there are a few observations we can make. One is that if you just take six spins in a, in a loop, a hexagon, and calculate the gap to excitations on that hexagon, the gap is pretty large. The gap is a large fraction of J. Um, and then that by itself doesn't seem like much because you would think, well, the interactions between hexagons are basically of the same size as the Hamiltonian on the hexagon. So you would think that that would then induce a lowering of the energy to excitations and then some, some instability. But it's actually not so because the lowest energy uh, excitations on the single hexagon due to some kind of symmetry selection rules lack any ma matrix element to propagate around. Once you add the, the, the interactions on the lattice, they can't hop to the neighboring hexagons. 
And that's why when you do a kind of uh, expansion around the hexagon set, you end up with this flat band here. And the flat band means that um, the, the gaps excitations on the hexagons can't reduce their energy by, by delocalizing. And therefore that kind of prevents there being, from being an instability from condensing them. So that's one argument for stability. Another argument is that, um, which is going in a slightly different direction is saying, okay, because this, this degeneracy, although it's large, is sub-extensive, um, to get from one hexagon state to another, I have to shift an entire layer of hexagons, which is obviously like a very high order property. Uh, the, the order of perturbation theory I would need to go to is, is kind of scaling with the layer size um, and will therefore be suppressed in the thermodynamic limit. And therefore you can't reduce the energy of this variational state by making a coherent superposition of the, of the hard hexagon states. And that's, that's kind of why this degeneracy seems to survive to a good approximation. Um, and then you can wonder, okay, why did previous numerics not see this? I think the, the answer we believe is simply that uh, there's a commensurability problem. Essentially, you need to stack a multiple of three unit cells in one direction in order to be able to, to fit these hexagon states in. And that isn't compatible with the simplest clusters that you could use for, for the numerics. And so that's why it wasn't seen before, or at least not seen in an obvious way. So that's essentially the, the main result I wanted to advertise you today. I think it's a pretty interesting and pretty surprising result that, that you write down this quantum Hamiltonian on the particle lattice um, and quantum fluctuations are somehow, although they somewhat uh, choose, a, choose a ground state instead of being, uh, ex instead of having a kind of extensive ground state degeneracy like the Ising model, they, they have a sub-extensive one, but it's still a very large degeneracy. Um, and, and you have all of these competing valence bond crystals. Now, one thing we then became interested in is, okay, that's, that's, how, that's where our arguments led us to for the pyrocool lattice. You might wonder if something similar happens in other problems. Um, and so to answer that question, um, we want to think, what, is the, what are the basic ingredients of the model that kind of allowed this to happen in our calculation? I think there are three basic ingredients. The first is that it was possible to decompose the lattice into unfrustrated units. So although a tetrahedron is highly frustrated, it has these kind of frost interactions formed from triangles, a hexagon is not frustrated at all, right? If I just have nearest neighbor interactions on a hexagon, that's fine, that's not frustrated. Um, and so I can decompose that as actually into unfrustrated units. And each of these individual unfrustrated units has a large gap to excitations in the isolated limit. And then the coupling between these units is highly suppressed because the coupling is very frustrated. And in fact, we called it doubly frustrated by which we mean that this coupling can be written as a product of two sums. And within each sum, uh, the two spins entering the sum are strongly anti-correlated. So it's kind of like the, you know, in a heuristic sense, it's kind of like the product of not just, it's not just one small number, it's a product of two small numbers. It's like second order suppressed. Um, and so these kind of symmetric coupling through a tetrahedron kind of strongly suppresses the effective interactions between these hexagons and kind of means that the state survives. And so then, the, what we want to do is look for other frustrated lattices where the same physics would happen. There were two that we could think of. One is the checkerboard lattice, which is kind of like the two-dimensional version of the pyroclore, where you have these checks corner sharing. And the other is the ruby lattice, where you have kind of um, a kind of threefold arrangement, once again, of these checked structures. And then you can apply the same arguments to those lattices. On the checkerboard lattice, um, you can say, okay, what's the smallest unfrustrated loop? It's one of these squares. Then you say, how many ways can I cover the lattice with those loops? And unlike the particle lattice, it's not exponential in system size. It's, there's only two ways. I either put the loops here where the red squares are, or I shift them all like one step to the diagonal. And that's the two coverings. And so then in this case, our, our same argument would predict a well-ordered Z2 symmetry breaking valence bond state. And that actually agrees with kind of previous numerical studies of the checkable lattice. So it's kind of a useful consistency check that uh, our arguments kind of make sense and consistent with other things that we know. And then on this Ruby lattice, you get a different case again, where the smallest unfrustrated loop at, loops are hexagons, and there's only one way to cover the lattice with them. So in this case, our approach would suggest a completely unique gapped paramagnetic ground state, so disordered ground state, not strictly a spin liquid, because there's, there's only very weak entanglement between hexagons, but a kind of quantum paramagnetic state. And so that would be our prediction for this, this, this highly frustrated two-dimensional model. And we can check those predictions against numerics by doing DMRG. So for the checkerboard and Ruby lattices, you know, it's in two dimensions. DMRG is pretty well established in those cases. 
We can do it for both s equals a half and s equals one. And for all of the three lattices I've talked about, pyrrhic or ruby and checkerboard, we can compare the energy of our variational wave function with DMRG, and it agrees extremely well. And the one arguable exception is the s equals one pyrrhic model, where the agreement is slightly less good. So maybe, maybe the state possibly may not be stable there, um, or may need some higher fluctuations to augment it. But even so, it's pretty close. And so uh, we actually believe that this, this approach is pretty generalizable. It doesn't apply just to the pyrrhic lattice. You can apply it to other, lat other frustrated lattices as well. Okay, I'm coming near the end. Um, so what are the implications from a theorist standpoint? The first is a kind of silly implication that, okay, we confirm that this 30 year old unsolved problem is really hard um, because we set out trying to find what the ground state is and we found like exponentially many of them. But maybe now we have a better idea of why it's so hard or why there are so many competing possibilities is because there's this construction uh, with with different hexagon coverings. And so once you have this kind of super abundance of, of uh, competing low energy states, it's going to be very difficult to untangle which one is actually the ground state. Um, we also have some heuristics, which I've just been describing in the last few slides, for understanding when the kind of valence bond crystal that this is an example of may be more stable than a quantum spin liquid based on, okay, can I decompose the lattice into unfrustrated units? And can I connect those units through, through some suppressed frustrated interaction? Um, and then finally, and I think maybe this is the most important theoretical implication of our work, is that this numerical link cluster expansion method, which has historically been mostly applied at high temperatures, uh, can under certain circumstances be pretty useful for understanding the ground state. And then from an experimental point of view, um, what does this mean? Well, it means a few things. One is that if you think you have a realization of the pyrochlor Heisenberg antiferromagnet, and there are a couple of suggested possibilities out there, uh, it may be really hard to actually access the ground state physics in experiment. Um, there, may, there, there may be some extremely low temperature scale associated with the degeneracy breaking between all these different states um, that, that you can't reach, and, and therefore the experiment is somehow controlled, not necessarily by the ground state, even at low temperatures, but by some, by some kind of competition of the manifold. Um, it also kind of, and this is something I'd be interested to investigate further, it seems to provide a kind of quantum post-justification of this observation on zinc chromate, which was understood from a, a classical point of view, but, but from real spin three over two, uh, maybe we don't know because we can't do our numerics for this, this uh, for that level of spin. Um, but it seems plausible that the same thing happens for spin three over two, and that would explain why you see these decoupled hexagons in, in zinc chromate. Um, and in that direction, I think it would be really interesting in other, in other potential Heisenberg uh, pyrochlor materials to look at the spin lattice coupling and see if there's any suggestion of, of like soft modes based on contracting these hexagons, which would be maybe a, a way of looking for the signatures in experiment. Okay, and so with that, I'll just uh, leave up these uh, these kind of key points, which are the main uh, take home messages of my talk, and I will thank you very much for listening. Questions, please. Michelle. Can, can, you, can you hear me now? Yeah, I guess yeah, people can hear me. Um, somewhere in the middle of your talk, you, you had a pendulum that decided if it was like a, a yeah. lattice or like a, a bomb model. It, mm. What's your conclusion then at the end? Well, this this view holds them quite, quite strongly in the direction of lattice is actually very stable. Um, because, and indeed, and some, they're not exactly the same as the previous proposals, but they break a lot of the same symmetry. These experts say they break the version of the bridge which is very, very different symmetry. So, in some sense, it points in the direction that the, 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 the lattice symmetry breaking and valence bonds are indistinguishable. And it doesn't point so much in the direction of the spin liquid because um, there's no way to kind of combine these. You might hope that somehow you can make some positive superposition of the like spin coverings and this would be a better spin liquid. Um, but because they're not connected at any point of order of perturbation theory, there's no real way to that. So, it seems to, to point more in the direction of the the proposal of famous bonds crystals, but it adds to that the realization that there are actually many more than we realize that are possibly candidate ground states of the black ring. We have a question from Sherbro. And yes, thank you for this uh, very nice talk. We have a question from Benjamin. Oh, hello. So thanks for the presentation. Uh, I had a question regarding uh, so you said DMRG couldn't capture this hexagonal ground state, but then when you compared your variational ground state energy, you say that it was like pretty close to the DMRG result actually. So I was 
I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit more on on this. Yeah, this is this is a really good question, right? So 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 yeah, so so the degree take point. And so so the the DMRD is done on the forty eight side cluster, which is two by two by two uh, cubic unit cell, and we know that these hexagon states only fit on multiples of three. So we know that there shouldn't be the hexagon states in this DMRD calculation. Uh, but uh, and indeed the hexagon state wasn't seen in the DMRD calculation, although they saw a state which breaks many of the same symmetries. Uh, but nevertheless, the energy is the same, or up to up to what we can conclude. So, so this is this is like interesting. There are, there are a couple of possibilities that explain this, and perhaps I should be honest. The first possibility is that what we found is only the subset of the possible ground states, and there's actually even more, right? Including some that fit on the side that fits like cluster. That's one possibility. Um, a second possibility is that um, in order to extract the DMRG energy, you have to do some finite size scaling. There aren't many system sizes. So actually, the DMRG energy may even be slightly above, which would then account for the possibility that you have to have a domain somewhere inside. Okay. Um, so, the, the, yeah, so I, I guess those are the two possibilities. Either there's kind of more degeneracy than you think, or maybe there's the third possibility. There's either more degeneracy than you think, or the DMRG energy. The, the finite size scaling, which was done with only a few system sizes, wasn't quite like good enough. Or, um, or domain walls are extremely cheap. We actually don't have a good sense of how much the energy a domain will cost in the state when you move from fluctuations. Um, so this, this is another option. So there's definitely more to be understood there. Um, and uh, yeah, I said, so, so yeah, that's, that's true. There's, there's more to be understood there. I mean, I think one thing we can say is that at least in terms of the the type of symmetry breaking that's seen between the MYG or variation of Monte Carlo or artifact here, the, the kind of type of symmetry breaking and version symmetry breaking is the same. But yeah, clearly there's, there's something more kind of so it's why the energy is the same. But what we can the other firm statement we can make is that we've measured the variation of energy of our variation weight functions that we can, and it's competitive with, with any other variation of energy that's not literature better than what you think. That's the only thing. But yeah, there's there's still something to be to be cleared up there about. What exactly the relationship is between our dots and the DMRG? Just another quick question. So, what about the stability to other perturbations? You know, I know this is <laughs> asking a lot, but you know, longer range interactions or you know, dipole interactions. Yeah. So other interactions. Um, so yeah, we've we've started to play with this a bit, but we haven't got very far. So I, I can't I can't say too much. Um, so what, okay, so the obvious statement we can make is that these states are all gapped and have a fairly robust gap, so there must be some regime of stability, and there's no, like, symmetry reason why they should suddenly fail when you introduce a, a different, different perturbation, they're not fine-tuned in that sense. Um, but yeah, I don't, I can't say much definitive about, like, you know, how much second neighbor interaction can you add before it breaks? Yeah, I, I, I don't know is the answer, and, uh, uh, th that may be something that we can do in the future. We've played a bit with XXZ type interactions to see, okay, now let's see if we can go back towards the eyes in the mid, what happens. Um, and you can see some regime of stability, but it's not it's not completely clear. Maybe this is something for the future. And uh, what was the inspiration for the variational weight function? Is it some sort of Goodswiller projection or? Um, so the inspiration was really the linked cluster expansion results. So we got this numerical linked cluster expansion result first. And then were surprised by it and wanted to make a variational uh, calculation because the link cluster expansion by itself isn't variational. Um, and so we wanted to just construct something which um, which which kind of has the physics of the hexagons built in, but then dresses the hexagons in some way with quantum fluctuations. Um, and this is and this is that that wave function is essentially the simplest way that you can do that. So you need the exponential operator because otherwise you don't get an extensive contribution to the entropy from the fluctuations. In order to get an extensive contribution from the fluctuations, you need to apply kind of an exponential operator to the, to the mean field state. Um, and so that's kind of like the simplest way that you can dress the, the decoupled hexagon state. And, and that was the, yeah, that was essentially the, uh, the in intuition. Okay, thank you very much. No more questions from here, as far as I can tell. <laughs> okay, Montreal, I have one more question. Uh, you mentioned if it's a lattice, I mean, 
do I understand that it could be coupled to the motion of the atoms? Mm -hmm. And is there, could, it, could this, such a state be seen in the, in the phonon spectra or like yeah. some softening of the phonon spectra or? So, so that's a, yeah, that's a good question. So I believe, I believe yes, is basically the answer to the question. So we haven't done the calculation yet, but the point is that these states break the symmetry of the lattice. And they break it in such a way that some bonds in the lattice are strongly more favored than others. So there's, you would think there would be some kind of tendency of the system to want to kind of contract those bonds and expand the other ones. And that would should lead to some kind of softening at certain wave vectors of the phonon spectrum. Um, yes. So, so the, the broad brushstroke answer to your question is yes, this is an interesting thing to look at. I don't have a detailed calculation which really goes into the, into the, the quantitative physics of this, but I think this is a good direction. So, so you had this uh, trouble between um, uh, you, you because you had localized state at high temperature, you got the heat capacity right, and then at low temperature because the the ground state spans through all the lattice basically. So, could you kind of figure out the the how unlock, unlocalized the states are in between because uh, mm -hmm. uh, how far your uh, your uh, System expansive or your expansion uh, goes. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so, so the question is related to this this idea that the hexagon expansion, if we do it as a function of temperature, converges at zero temperature and, and at high temperature, right? But not not in the middle. Um, and so, and so, there's, um, yeah, we. It's difficult to to really get much further with this because we become very because to do link cluster expansion. You basically have to do a full full spectrum exact diagonalization of each cluster, and so once you get beyond a few hexagons, this becomes like really difficult. And so there's only there's only a limited amount we can say about this intermediate regime. But the intu intuition is that at some point, you know, you have we say you know there are these hexagon states at zero energy, then the lowest lying excitations form some kind of flat band. That was the result of our boson calculation. But then at higher, higher energies, the excitations are dispersive. So once your temperature is high enough that you're exciting the dispersive bands, then this kind of fully localized picture doesn't work anymore. And that's the regime where NLC will now start to break down until I go to higher temperature when once again correlations become super short range. And so that's the kind of intuitive idea of why the physics would work like that. But we can't say much quantitative using the this method in that regime because we really kind of come up against an exponential wall of how far we can push the expansion. 